Ever since we acquired the Centurion Micro Plus system as part of the Vintage Geek Collection, I've been anxiously awaiting the day when we can try to turn this system on and see what it'll do. And today is going to be that day with the help of David from Usagi Electric. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, if you like vintage technology and vintage computers, please like and subscribe. It helps us a lot as we grow, and I encourage you to become a Vintage Geek member. We've got a lot of extra content on the site. You should check it out at VintageGeek.com. I'm really excited to have a special guest here at Vintage Geek today, David from Usagi Electric, the expert on Centurion. That's what I refer to you as. Is that, is that your working title? I would say no, because <laughs> I've met three or four people that used to work at Centurion. Right. They're the experts. So yes. I'm just trying to keep up. So, <laughs> so for any of our viewers that, that don't already know, you have an entire Centurion system, the mini computer system, that you've been working on. When did you start? Two years ago, I guess. Okay. Um, it's been a, a pretty arduous journey. Hilariously, I wasn't even shopping for Centurion. I was shopping for a TI-990, okay. which is another mini computer system. And I came across this one up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And it just said Centurion system, and it was like 100 bucks. So wow. I was like, it's worth the drive. So I went up to yeah. Oklahoma and picked it up and came back with two cabinets, three terminals, a 19 disc packs. I mean, it was <laughs> like, it was a steal. I felt yeah. bad. I felt like I was robbing the guy. <laughs> we knew nothing about the system. I mean, as you found out the hard way is <laughs> yes. when you Google Centurion, <laughs> nothing comes up. Right. Uh, and so we were learning, we were learning the hard way pretty much, trying to reverse engineer as much as we could. And then uh, Ken Romain got in touch with me who used to actually work at Centurion. He was very familiar and very intimate with the system and he hooked me up with the diagnostic board. And from that, we were able to reverse engineer some code and figure stuff out. And then I got in touch with another really brilliant guy, DJ, who had actually come across a second Centurion mini computer system. So we, I got that system and then we got, the, we got the two Hawk drives out of it and I managed to restore one of those. And then we got the system up and going, found an operating system. And so we have this full on big bad mamma jamma cabinet with a uh, chock full of Centurion hardware that's running. And then nice. we built the second one for funsies. You have an interesting idea of fun and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how we roll. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the Micro Plus because I knew nothing about this system at all until one of our viewers kindly pointed out that there's an entire channel about the Centurion <laughs> system after they saw our museum intro video. So tell me about the Micro Plus because I know that you've, you've looked into the history of all of this. So the Micro Plus is really fascinating because this is like late Centurion. Okay. This is going to be about 1983, 84, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. So Centurion's history was they started in about 1972 building the big systems and they went all the way till they, they got acquired by EDS in 81 and then they continued to build systems up to about 84 when they went bankrupt in EDS, corporate espionage, backstabbing, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but so this was, I believe during the EDS reign and it, 83, 84 was right when the PC was coming on market. Sure. And so there was this kind of dread coming over the mini computer manufacturers that smaller and more compact was the future. Mm -hmm. They knew it, they didn't want to admit it, but they knew sure. it. Sure. The Micro Plus was Centurion's kind of first step towards a smaller, more compact machine. But what's fascinating about this is that it uses the exact same CPU, memory card, and multiplexer card as my big boy machine uses. Okay. Uh, inside, this is a full-fledged multi-user mini computer stuffed into a desktop-sized cage. Well, almost desktop-sized <laughs> <Yes>. cage. <laughs> a beefy desktop. Yeah, beefy desktop. <laughs> uh, they did use uh, the Finch floppy controller card, so okay. I, I happen to have one of those on my machine as well. And this is a controller card that can control a Finch drive and up to three floppy drives, okay. which is what you have here. You've got a CDC Finch drive and uh, one floppy drive. But that controller was also capable of controlling a CDC RIN the first generation RIN, which was okay. a five and a quarter drive. Interesting. Um, and so you could also have a five and a quarter floppy next to it. Hmm. So it could control both of those. Okay. Um, which means that this this uh, bottom cage here could have been a lot smaller as well. Oh wow. Um, so it would have made a, a slightly more compact system for the desk. And it just depended on what the customer wanted. But this is a full on multi-user system, which I find fascinating. It seems like from what you're saying that they took the approach of let's just make it physically smaller. Let's take the tech that we have and try to make it an, into a smaller form factor so it's a little bit more PC competitive. Exactly. The, yeah. the only thing that's unique compared to my actual big boy system is the backplane. Okay. It's just a, a special four slot backplane as opposed to the 14 slot backplane on the big boy system. I that's see. That's it. Other than that, the cards are identical. Even this up here, which looks really fancy and neat, those are the same switches that do the same things on the, the big system. I think that you told me that the, the floppy drives that you have 
don't have an eject mechanism or a self-eject mechanism? No, so I have actual CDC floppies. Okay. And interestingly, you've got a QM floppy. Yes. Um, so uh, originally, Centurion used pretty much exclusively CDC drives. So it was really interesting to see the QM. But with the CDC ones, you, you push the button and the door just like slams open with this like <laughs> sickening quack as it's like metal on metal. But then the disc is still in there and you gotta like pull it out. You should try to eject this right, one. Let's try that. Let's try that. Oh, is it not gonna work? There it goes. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> That's satisfying, right? <laughs> That's so cool. Let's talk a little bit about how we want to go through and see what we can get working in this system. What we'll start with and kind of how we'll progress. The main system up here has the four cards in it, and then you've got the drives on the bottom, the finch and the floppy. The finch is by far and away the scariest thing of this whole whole shebang that we're doing. Right. Generally, Centurion cards are like rock solid. I've mm -hmm. had probably 25 or 30 cards come through the the shop that I'm working on and I've only had one bad card. Oh, that's great. Terrifyingly enough, it was a multiplexer card, so hopefully your multiplexer <laughs> card is fine. But everything else has been rock solid. So the CPU, I'm 99% confident it'll come up. The MUX cards, of the three that I've had, only one of them was bad, so the other two were totally fine. Okay. So I'm fairly confident that those two are going to be fine as well. I think this one had water damage, so that was why it didn't work. The FFC card should be good if it doesn't have any obvious damage on it. The memory card is 4116s, so those have a bad reputation, but I haven't come across any bad ones on Centurion cards yet. Oh, great. Uh, except for ones that had so much water damage the pins rusted off. The cards, I'm fairly confident, will come up pretty easily. So we'll start with uh, just the core basics. We'll pop the FFC card out and we'll do CPU 6, memory card, and uh, the, the MUX card, and we'll plug that into the terminal. If the stars align, <laughs> uh, we should see a D equals prompt, and that means that essentially the system's booted and it's looking for something to boot from. Awesome. So the, it's been bootstrapped off of the bootstrap ROM on the uh, backplane, and it's looking for a drive to load the operating system from. And so that'll get us essentially 70% of the way there. And then if, if we've got that, then it's just down to the big scary Finch drive. <laughs> and of course we've got the, the terminal, which is also an unknown in the equation. If it doesn't work for some reason, or we can't get the terminal online, we can still access the system using a standard laptop. It's just a like a regular old RS-232 terminal. Well, I'm really excited to uh, to get going with this and, and see how far we can get with it. We're gonna try and take it all the way. I don't, no promises. Let's get into it. Let's do it. So David, our first line of business here <laughs> was to see if we could get the Centurion terminal that we have up and running. We set out to do that first. Kind of ran into some stumbling blocks uh, right out of the gate. Immediately. We did not get any kind of feedback from the terminal. There was no, no red light indicator, no beep, and apparently no, we couldn't tell anything was happening with CRT, no filament, nothing like that. Yeah, it looked totally dead. So we saw a dead resistor on the power supply. Right. Did an educated guess that it was 220 ohms. Replace that resistor, but still totally dead. Yeah. Absolutely no life coming out of it whatsoever. And we um, did buy one of every kind of resistor that started with 22 because the bands were actually burned off. So yeah. we, we couldn't tell the actual we value. We could see the first band. The first yes. band was red. <laughs> All the others were burned completely out. And so red is a good indication that it's going to be a, a 22 of some kind. Educated guess put us at 20, 220 ohm. Yeah. So I think that was pretty close to being correct, but it seems logical, but yeah. uh, it, it still did not yield any any results. Yeah. But we were able to get it to beep, at least, by removing the analog board That's from right. the equation. We disconnected the power to the analog board. Lo and behold, the thing beeped and sounded like it was trying to come to life. Right. But obviously, because the, the analog board doesn't have any power going into it, we're not going to get any high voltage, never going to get any display coming out of it. So the primary terminal board, I think, is fine. Right. I think we just have a, a borked 
power supply. We didn't have the correct uh, capacitors to replace the main filter caps that are on that power supply, so that'll be something that we'll do for next time. And we knew that we would be able to use another terminal to ultimately be able to see if the Centurion system is working or how we could get it to work potentially. Yeah. Um, using a you know standard modern PC with a serial adapter. Um, but we had a little bit of a snafu there as well. I have, at home, I have a uh, USB to RS-232 adapter. Right. And the nine pin on the Centurion coming out of the Micro Plus here is not standard because right. That's pinout that Centurion decided on. They decided on in like 72 or something, which predates <laughs> the IBM 9-pin standard that came by like 10 years. Yes. So it's whatever Centurion has. So you have to do a little custom rewiring. And uh, you brought a, a beautifully made adapter cable specifically for the Centurion to go to serial. For that. Yeah. Um, but I forgot to bring my RS-232 to USB thing. <laughs> so that ruled out my laptop right off the bat. Right. So then we started hunting through here. and <laughs> We found your TRS-80 uh, data terminal. That right. would have been perfect. DT1, it had, yeah. It actually has ads uh, Regent 25, emulation, right? Regent 25 or something like that emulation on it. So that would have been flawless. Yes. And of course it turns on and powers on great. The keyboard, I'm pretty sure is foam <laughs> and foil, so the keyboard didn't work. Right. <laughs> we were out of sorts on that. And then we thought me about maybe some of the IBM PCs or even you have a Windows 10 uh, PC and running TerraTerm on that because we know the TerraTerm works with the machine. And it does have a serial port. And it, yeah, <laughs> which is a rare <laughs> yes. thing for Windows 10, but it does have a serial port. But it was uh, a DE9 and it was male instead of female or female <laughs> instead of male. It was the wrong one. Right. So it's the standard serial game that you go through where you have 10,000 adapters to try and get to the, <laughs> the right connector side. We had every adapter we didn't need. That's exactly, exactly <laughs> right. So we ultimately ended up cutting a a spare serial cable that you had and right. soldering it in directly to my DB25 cable that we had. <laughs> and yes. So now we have a cable that goes from Centurion DE9 to a uh, serial DE9 or a DB25 for a data terminal or a modern more modern machine. Right, and then uh, we brought our, our Windows 10 machine into the workspace so that we could you know, use the TerraTerm on that and yeah. and be able to see what's going on with the Centurion. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we got everything plugged in, we got everything set up, and uh, we, we didn't really get anything <laughs> right, right, right away. <laughs> Nothing showed up on the Nothing on showed the up. So we have multiple failings on my part as the understanding of the system as well as how we had things hooked up. The biggest problem that we ran into head first was since this is a CPU 6 system, I was assuming it had a uh, CPU 6 era bootstrap ROM on the back, sure. like mine has. Yeah. Uh, so the big machine, when you turn it on, the bootstrap ROM runs a certain set of code that brings up a D equals prompt. That was the prompt that I was talking about, let's get to. Yes. Centurion actually made different bootstrap ROMs, and some of them predate that style of bootstrap ROM by quite a bit, and that just so happens to be what's in here. And because this can only ever have a Finch and a Floppy in it, there's no, re no reason to have that D equals prompt. Right. You, your only option is either F0 or F1 or vice versa. Yeah. And you select that with this little disc button right up here on the top. Mm -hmm. So I was running down this path trying to get to a D equals prompt when it would just never actually exist. And right. so I brought the diag card and we were gonna do some diagnostics and stuff like that. But those bootstrap ROMs that don't have the D equals actually predate the diag card. So they don't have any support for the diag card. But if that initial instruction isn't in the bootstrap ROM, it never jumps to where the diag card is, the diag card never comes alive. So we lost a little bit of time <laughs> running down that path. I called Ken Romain. Ken, thank you so much if you're watching. Yes, you're, thank you very an much. Absolute <laughs> legend. Uh, and he, we were talking about the bootstrap ROMs and he said that that particular ROM has uh, FF written on it, which right. stands for Finch, Finch Floppy. floppy. Mm -hmm. So that was a Finch Floppy specific ROM, which would predate diag cards. So that got us headed in the correct direction from there. And basically um, with our ROM, the only thing, as you said, that it can do is load from either of these drives. It's, it's exactly. And it'll never get to the diagnostics card because it just wasn't programmed to do that. Exactly. So, so all of our tests and trying to see what the diagnostics <laughs> card was doing was kind of fruitless. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of tidbit information there. Ken said that when he carried that diag card around, he would always carry a spare bootstrap ROM on it that had okay. that diag jump in it. So when he would get to a system, he would just immediately switch the bootstrap ROM out. So he right. knew that it would jump into it. But, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I don't have a spare bootstrap ROM like that. 
Right. Um, because it's in my other systems at home <laughs> currently being used. <laughs> well, not only that, I mean, w w there's a total of how many Centurions <laughs> that we know of right now? Five <laughs> yeah. existing Centurions that I know of. Uh, you have one, right. there's a desk system in Cincinnati, and I've got the other three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so not a whole lot of extra bootstrap ROMs no, just hanging no. around. The bootstrap ROM on this will really pretty much only do one thing. Right. Uh, it'll try to boot into either the initial program loader, which is what this bu button on the bottom does, or the operating system, which is what this button on the top does. So you push the button that you want to push depending on where you want to go. Yeah. Uh, and then it'll go to either floppy at zero or finch at one. Right. And if those drives don't exist, it'll give us an error code. And so once I knew that that was the type of bootstrap ROM we were dealing with, the goal shifted from trying to get to a D equals prompt to trying to get to an error code. Exactly. Because if we can get it to display an error code, that tells us that one, the bootstrap ROM is good. Two, the CPU is actually executing code. Right. Three, the memory is good because if there's a huge fault on the memory, the CPU will just halt. Right. And four, the MUX card is good because it'll be sending data to the data terminal. Once we were headed in the right direction, it only took us about an hour of fiddling and making sure that things were right. And sure enough, we turned it on, we hit the select button and we got error. Turned out most of our problems were in the cabling. Well, and the good news is during the process, and you would notice this, that the, all of the logic on the front seemed to be functioning normally, even when we weren't getting anything on the terminal initially. You know, you could actually, we'd get the system malfunction light, you know, for which would indicate the error that you're talking about. And then you could actually select one of these other buttons and it would actually go out of that. So it did give us the sign that there was something happening yeah. with, with the board, the CPU and everything in the system. We just weren't getting any output until we discovered the cabling issue. Then we finally got an error. That was a pretty exciting time to see an error message. I've never been quite that excited <laughs> to see the word error, but uh, it seemed like it had been a while since we'd seen anything come out yeah, of this. So. Yeah. The thing that I was pretty confident of the whole time that all four of the boards in this main ch chassis up here are fine. Yeah, they're, they're uh, working. They're gonna, so all of our problems now are with, in the bottom half. With the drives. With the drives. And, and that was actually the part that I think that you and I were both most concerned about trying oh, yeah. to get it to work because anytime you have you know, mechanical parts and everything else, there's always a pretty good risk yeah. that something's not going to work. Uh, yeah. I mean, we did discover a major fault on it, that there is a dead short between 5 volt and ground on the logic board of the Finch drive. Right. Because of that, that dead short on the Finch drive and because someone wouldn't have necessarily gone into the system to work on it whenever this was deployed and in service somewhere, whenever that short happened, we discovered that it takes down the whole system because it, it derails the, the 5 volt supply. You no longer get anything out of the CPU or any of the rest of the system. So whenever this fault originally occurred, in whatever year, the people that had the system probably just said, oh, it's it's dead for good. Yeah, absolutely. It totally craters the five volt rail, which shuts the entire system off. If you just unplug the Finch, then all of a sudden the main boards come back to life. Yeah. So probably the Finch developing the, that fault is what caused this machine to be decommissioned. I have a Finch that's misbehaving as well, so it's a good opportunity to put them both up side by side. Right. Try to bring them up together because it's always even though they're slightly different models, it's always nice to have two because they're going to fail in different ways. Usually. Sure. Um, so you can cross-reference against the two of them as you bring them up. Yeah. And uh, hopefully your broken finch will help me bring my broken finch up and my broken finch will help me bring your broken finch up and then we could have two working finches by the end. That's the goal. So now we have to figure out how do we get this to try to do something beyond just posting an error on screen. How do we get it to, you know, load something, at least the initial program loader or something to that degree. And you had the idea of, well, let's see what we can do with the floppy. Every drive, track zero, is always the initial program loader. No matter what drive you have connected up to the system, if you push this initial program loader button, it'll boot up to a prompt that says name equals. Okay. And from there, you can type in the name of the bare metal program that you want to run, what drive it's located on, and if it has a passcode, what the passcode is to access it. The system goes in, finds that file, and executes it. These two really do the same thing, but the operating system one cuts out that extra step of you having to type at OSN, hit enter, and do all of that. But the IPL loads on 
both of them. Centurion calls it the Whipple. Okay. Uh, because <laughs> WarX was their original name. Ah, so yes. So WarX initial program <laughs> loaders. So the Whipple will load and get us to a name equals prompt. And no matter what, that floppy is going to have a Whipple on it. So that was the next goal, but we still didn't get there. <laughs> we did do uh, some head cleaning, but unfortunately, even though the drive spins up, it is not functional currently. It's like the logic is there. Five volt rail's working. Right. It, you, it, it knows that there's a disk in the drive yeah. to the point where it will error on the system if you don't have the disk in the That's drive. That's right. But when you actually try to load the disk, nothing happens with the physical head on the drive. That's when we discovered that the floppy drive has another fun problem where the 24 volt rail has a dead short on it. <laughs> Thankfully, at least this one has the full schematic, so it might be a yeah. little bit easier to get to the bottom of that. Yeah. Um, and it looks like it's deriving a bunch of voltages on the board, so maybe it's something as easy as a voltage regulator that, that went south. Even if we did get it to work and we got to a name equals prompt, there's still nothing we can do from there. Right. Because that floppy is just gonna have basically data on it. Of course. Nobody in their right mind ever put an operating system on right. a floppy disk. I mean, I did it because I'm crazy. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it just takes forever to boot. It's really slow. It was miserable to use. There's a couple paths forward that we're going to run down. One is getting your floppy going, because if you can get your floppy going, then I can mail you floppy disks, and we can actually get it to do stuff, like maybe play Snake or something. Right. In the meantime, while we're troubleshooting and figuring out the Finch. And right. you can take the floppy disk with you that we have here to be able to calibrate your floppy drive potentially. If I can get a floppy drive that matches your floppy drive, then I'll align that floppy drive to the disk that I'm taking home. Right. And then we now have a way that we can share data between each other by uh, like a period correct way that we can share data between. Sure. Them. So another path that we're going to run down and one that we've been working on a bit on uh, my group that helps me with my Centurion is building a floppy emulator. Once we get that going, we'll get that up here as well. And then it's a lot easier to send you files. I don't have to actually put a stamp on them <laughs> right. and mail them. <laughs> exactly. Just email. Yes. <laughs> but the idea. goal is to have this machine and my machine running at essentially the same level mm -hmm. so we can trade files back and forth as we update something on our system, we can update your system with that new file as sure. well. With the whole community that you've you know, created with your channel and everything, and a lot of people developing things, it'd be great to be able to you know, use some of that, um, like Absolutely, you were talking about yeah. the Snake program and some yeah. of the other, the other programs out there, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, the, that this was still a success, even though we had a lot of, a lot of setbacks, but I, I think that uh, getting it to the error state that we got it to, we, we were able to prove a few things. Certainly that the, the main CPU is in working order. Yep. Um, all the cards seem to be functioning fine. Yep. We've just got drive issues. That's and, right. Well, and terminal issues. <laughs> <laughs> and, our, and, our, and our drives are terminal, but yeah. you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Even if we just have to put a new power supply in it. Yeah, I'm 99% <laughs> certain it's just power issues on it. Yeah, so. that's what it seems like. Yeah. And we do have the other Centurion terminal we will be getting at some point. Yeah, there still, we go. Still in, still in storage, so yeah. it'll be fun to see what, uh, what mysteries await in, in that one. <laughs> that's right. Probably the same problems. <laughs> David, it was an absolute pleasure having you here. Pleasure was all mine, and I'll be back, I promise. <laughs> all right, that sounds great. Just a quick reminder, if you're into vintage technology and vintage computers, please like and subscribe. It's gonna help us a lot as we grow. And I also encourage you to become a member of Vintage Geek. You can do that at our website. It's vintagegeek.com. We've got all sorts of extra video content. We've got code snippets. We've got special discounts on museum and mission. Definitely check it out. Consider becoming a member. It's at vintagegeek.com. Until next time, I'm Aaron, and this has been Vintage Geek.